that is why our teachers used to say that tawakkul is uh, is the secret of Allah in the hearts of his servants. Mm. They used to tell us, don't you dare ever get carried away with the knowledge that you have. Yeah, you memorize these books or give these lectures and can answer these questions on a dime and so on and so forth. He said, but that trader, business trader, like trade transactional, uh, could have so many moments where his back is against the wall and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala you know, uh, pulls him from it, you know, comes through for him in that sense, uh, resolves his issue that he could have far superior tawakkul than you in the school of life, right? Bismillahirrahmanirrahim. Assalamu alaikum, everyone. My name is Razia Hamidi. Welcome to another episode of the Discovery Life podcast. So excited for this topic because this is one that I know we get so many people inquiring about. Every believer is wrestling with it on some level. And so alhamdulillah, I am so excited to have with me today, Sheikh Mohammed al Shiniawi. And I'm sure you guys follow him on Facebook, mashallah, Sheikh. I love your posts. You're always giving so much depth. So welcome to the Discovery Life podcast. Happy to be amongst you, Sarazia. Alhamdulillah. So for those that don't know, Sheikh Mohammed is with Yakin Institute. He's also with Mishka University and Marshall, a local resident at his mosque. And you've got your, your plate full, but Alhamdulillah, I'm so glad you were able to make time uh, for this conversation. And, um, you know, Sheikh, kind of to e ease into things, I wanted to just ask, um, you know, what usually inspires you with your posts? Because you've always, always loved seeing what you're coming up with, what you're thinking about. So is it usually like you're reading through things and something pops up? Do you keep a journal? Like what kind of inspires you in that realm? Uh, <laughs> you just hit a chord. Uh, <laughs> I wish I kept a journal. I used to keep a journal wow. uh, in Medina. And maybe there is a very clear path to connecting that to Tawakkul. Uh, I, I, think, I think we're not thinking as mm -hmm. often as we should be, including myself. Uh, and I think sort of uh, logging how I'm feeling uh, directly or indirectly uh, into a journal, in hindsight, was of the greatest uh, sort of access points, honest moments in my life, access points to my vulnerability. And people may not realize, you know, as the early Muslims, they used to say that, that my treasure is my incapability or my incompetence and my treasures are found in my poverty. And so like, you know, you, you wanna deny that you can't and deny that you don't have, but that could actually be, you know, one of the greatest, like, I don't even want to call it a growth point, really like launch pads uh, that boost your relationship with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Uh, you know, in Medina, I, uh, oh my God, I don't think I ever shared this publicly, but I, uh, I, I, I suffered a lot. <laughs> um, like mentally speaking, Allah showed me my brokenness. It was, it, I don't fully understand why it was, but there was a little bit of OCD there. Yeah. Uh, there was lots of uh, also just very reasonable anxieties because I sort of had left my wife and my child was one year old. And mm -hmm. as soon as I got there, they shut the door on visa. So I couldn't bring my wife over and my kid and he had pneumonia and my father also was very sick. And so it, it, I think it, it got very problematic. But in hindsight, like I went to Medina after eight years of da'wah without training and I had become... Uh, a version of myself that I, I I just thank Allah I never died in that state, uh, you know I think I was I was a little or a lot full of myself very delusional in a sense you know just very conceited I, I had no mentorship I I didn't know my limits of what I should and shouldn't speak on and I was asked to speak so much that uh, I never had time to reflect on you know how big the gaping hole was between what I was learning what I was actually committing to myself so many things yeah. and so Allah sort of through this mental health bout I he showed me my brokenness he broke me uh <laughs> and you would never think so that this could be one of your greatest you know growth moments in your relationship with Allah and even your love of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala you know it was tough it, it was quite a pinch a six-month pinch uh but I, I learned to trust him I learned to defer to him and what was crazy also speaking of like the insecurities that I know are abound in our day and age and I can reflect on, you know, sort of the secular mindset really feeding into that. Like, it really is such a, uh, a psychological burden to tell people, you know, it's abuse. I call it abuse to tell people you own your own destiny because mm -hmm. I can't control it yet. I'm responsible for it. And it's just so unfair to think this way and so heavy. And so 
Yeah, without ranting, uh, I'm trying to suppress a lot right now. Uh, <laughs> I, I feel like we're going to have a session, a counseling session here, but I, I want to say I really appreciate your vulnerability because I think sometimes we get to talk to our teachers and mentors and it's such a polished version. And I'm sure I'm speaking for probably everyone who's listening to this. There's such a richness that comes from the vulnerability, vulnerability that's shared and knowing that subhanAllah, you're, the knowledge you share, the perspective that you have, it's not just coming from someone who's had the textbook knowledge and the, the theory of the deen, but alhamdulillah has lived it and has connected with that. And so when you're talking about this brokenness and having experienced, um, you know, those intense moments, alhamdulillah, I think that comes out in your work and that comes in. I, I know for me, it comes out through mashallah, the posts and the reflections that you do share. There's a depth to it that we don't always get. So just like ahead for yeah, opening yeah. up. Yeah, my, just like the, the biggest, like, I guess, moment of when it really crystallized for me that I need to trust Allah because I have nothing else. Mm -hmm. I used to go to Sheikh after Sheikh in Medina. These are high caliber, tier one, world-class scholars. And I couldn't explain to any of them what my problem was, or I thought I could, and they couldn't understand me. And so I felt like I was all alone. And that is what causes you to just, you know, turn your back on, on everything and, and realize that we're all just, you know, brittle, fragile, transient, limited beings. And, and, and Allah is this perfect God that if you don't like hinge your, your, uh, your confidence in him, you'll always be in like perpetual, you know, ready to be shattered mode. May Allah protect us. I mean, it seems like such an obvious statement of what you just shared. You know, I, I realized how fallible I was and then I turned to look but that's like the most liberating and sweetest moment that a believer can have when you when you accept your limitations yeah. your imperfectness subhanallah so Sheikh went right into it and I and I appreciate that because I love cutting through the small talk um so alhamdulillah we're, we're talking about the wakul today and you know I shared with Sheikh Muhammad earlier what my intention for this was um I have so many numerous conversations with women and you know I'm sure brothers are struggling with this too that they're constantly questioning themselves and constantly feeling this guilt of, I'm not trusting Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. I don't trust Allah. Um, and I'm talking about people who, you know, alhamdulillah are doing the acts of worship, who are trying, striving to walk on that path. And so I wanted to, in our conversation, really unpack what the wakul looks like, what it means, the different faces it has, and alhamdulillah, why it's so foundational um, in our relationship with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And so that's my goal for today. And I hope that, you know, those of you that are listening, definitely like and subscribe to the channel, inshallah, for this every podcast to access more of these enriching conversations. And so I hope you get to walk away today feeling more hopeful and grounded in your understanding of the wakul. Um, I hope that we can you know, approach all the complexities that is. And so one of the, um, you know, first aspects, I guess, uh, Shaykh Muhammad, that I wanted to um, converse with you about and inshallah, you know, hear your perspective on is the idea of anchoring ourselves in tawakkul and how it's like, you know, when we talk about foundational aspects of our faith, right? So we we have our that we have our belief in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And then would you say, like, where would the wakul fall into that? If someone was were to look at, laying bricks of their faith down where would you put the buckle uh okay so i was actually just discussing with my students uh some of the meanings of al-fatiha recently and so this is why it's fresh but i also think it is it is one of the greatest things to cite for like a paradigm shift mm -hmm. for people that may think like uh, the actions of the heart which tawakkul is at you know uh at or near the pinnacle of are some secondary matter when they are the primary <laughs> and the external acts of worship are supposed to be an expression of all that expression of our love of Allah, our fear of him, our hope in him, our trust on, in him and all that. So the, 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 uh, the aphorism was that Ibn al-Qayyim, I believe it was Ibn al-Qayyim in his intro to Madarij, his book, uh, he says that the scholars of old would say that Allah has revealed 100 or so scriptures to this world, 100 divine communications to humanity. And then the gist and the best of them was summarized in the Torah, the Injil, the Zabur, and the Quran, in those four uh, scriptures. And then all of those, the gist and the best of them was summarized in the Quran brought to us in the Quran and perfected, of course, not to say the Quran does not have anything new and uh, it is certainly an upgrade and a confirmation, both, right? And then the Quran is summarized, essentially, uh, it's it's the heart of its message or the spirit of the Quran is is found in Al-Mufassal, the earliest surahs come down from the Quran. Um, and then Mufassal was summarized in Al-Fatiha and then Al-Fatiha was summarized in 
It's only you we devote ourselves to, and only in you do we uh, seek strength. Uh, and so imagine the reason Allah created the universe, the reason why he, uh, you know, created the human race, the reason why he revealed scriptures and dispatched, me dispatched messengers, uh, the metric by which we will all be measured on the day of judgment. That whole long cosmic story is summarized in, we devote our life to you and we seek strength from you. That second half is all to echo. How powerful, like it comes down to, to just that verse in Surah Fatiha to, again, like you said, a mindset shift and when we're reciting this verse daily in our Salah. And I think one of the things that um, a lot of people, SubhanAllah, or, or that, you know, we don't get a full grasp of is what, what does it look like to trust Allah SubhanAllah? Ta you know, is it just one dimensional? Does it only look one way? And so I feel like this is where maybe a lot of people get the block or a lot of that questioning um, and self-doubt that, you know, I'm not trusting Allah, I'm not trusting Allah. And, and that guilt can be really heavy. And sometimes I feel like, you know, that can be some of the seeds of despair that shaitan plants as well. And so, you know, what are some of the different ways that the can, like, what are some of the different aspects? And, we, you know, we can take, inshallah, inspiration from our tradition, but what can the look like? Does it just look the same? Yeah, no. So that, that is the issue that, Tawakkul is actually not necessarily or simplistically identifiable on the ground because tawakkul is an action of the heart, right? Uh, and so sometimes I may refuse to engage uh, because I believe there's not much point in engaging, engaging the, the, the tangible and just putting my trust in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And, you know, a manifestation of that could be, and this is a little bit controversial, um, people in terms of end-of-life care refusing uh, DNR, right? The, the, the whole issue of the not resuscitate, they mm -hmm. refuse to sign off, uh, you know, or they sign off that do not resuscitate me. I'm just leaving it to Allah, whatever he wants. And that should not be misused. I, I need to put a caveat here that if, if treatment is an option, we are obligated to seek treatment. But if we're talking about like end-of-life care, it's just a matter of quality of life, pain management, and otherwise majority of scholars would not require you to take that. You could simply put your trust in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Yeah. Uh, and then in, a, in, in the opposite now, I want to show you that it's not particularly identifiable on the outside. It's really about the states of the heart. A person may engage the medicine because they believe I'm putting my trust in Allah by doing everything in my hands, but I'm still recognizing in here that it's in his hands. So I, I heard this story once. Uh, that there used to be a guy who the, the physician said to him, this, this pill, your life depends on it. You got to take it religiously, <laughs> so, you know, be super strict with this medication. Um, any fault or in the, in the chemical imbalance, you're done. Um, and so the, the emphasis they placed on his life and his death hinging on this medication, he was afraid for him to sort of be relying on it not its creator, subhanahu wa ta'ala, because dawa, medicine, the Prophet said, he in qadarillah, it's part of Allah's decree, right? Mm -hmm. he, so he decreed that it exists, and he decreed that you have access to it if you do, right? And he decreed that it will and will not be sort of impactful. He can render it effective and ineffective. So it's really all about him, but you still got to do your part, in a sense. Uh, he gave you enough of a free will to hold you accountable for what you do. And so he, he reaches for the medicine, and every time he reaches for the medicine, he pulls it from the uh, canister he would throw it on the ground the medicine and sort of like dust it off hopefully it was clean <laughs> dust it off and he would take the medicine and I'd be like what are you doing he said I just want to remind myself that this pill can't even help itself let alone help me mm -hmm. and so that's an act of like supreme tawakkul as well that you're yeah. seeking you know uh, what Allah made available trusting in his sort of the design that he made his wisdom and at the same time I'm making sure my heart doesn't lean on it the same doctor can have a super successful surgery, save this guy's life, and he can, you know, uh, have his first super blunder and cost this guy his life, in a sense. Yeah. So, so I feel like those are really, you know, great examples. And what I would love to kind of just bring it to is I'm thinking of like the day to day. So when you okay. have someone who's, who's struggling with, um, you know, let's say, I don't know, they, they're struggling with their job or, um, you know, someone who's trying to get married. And so they have this, you know, they're worried. They're worried about maybe the state of things um, in that aspect. And so then that worry leads them to questioning, you know, I'm, I'm not trusting Allah. 
I'm worrying and so I'm not trusting in the law. And so would you say that is the welcome not manifesting then for them? Or is that just like, that's the human experience and condition that they're going through? Yeah, that's a super good question. Uh, and who said that worry negates tawakkul? <laughs> Nothing at all. In fact, you're not really trusting if you know the wisdom behind, you know, this uncertainty or this, you know, ambiguity in your life. You're trusting because you just know the one in charge, the one who does know the answers uh, is trustworthy. I'm, I'm, I'm good with that. You know, you don't really... Uh, know how a plane functions or how to drive a ship you may think you do uh it's not as meets the eye sometimes ships are easier than planes i agree uh but so but you don't even know the guy's name who's driving the ship or you know driving the plane but you know that like the person driving is the person supposed to be driving you just trust that it's going to take me where i want to be likewise i'm concerned i'm anxious so on and so forth uh but i know that you know allah is so him, he is he, he is subhanahu wa ta'ala, he is al-hayu alladhi la yamut, you know, al-qayyum alladhi uh, la yanam, the living, you know, that never dies, the one who oversees everything, never sleeps, you know, once, and that's sort of like what Ibn Qayyim says, that you, you combat this with that, right, the knowledge of God versus the lack of knowledge of, of the human condition, right, this is what, this is, he says you will not be able to have tawakkul without having four things, like proper tawakkul, he says number one is to have knowledge of Allah, Number two is to have certainty in qadar, in decree, in divine decree. Number three is to engage the means uh, that Allah makes available. Because if you don't, like I said, that's an insult to Allah's wisdom, that things are random. I'm going to plant an apple tree and get mangoes or something. That's an insult. But to believe that this seed is inherently capable, that's also not trusting God. That's, you know, it's shirk in a sense, right? You're <laughs> ascribing uh, inherent intrinsic power to other than Allah. So you're going to engage the means while not relying on them. So that's how it works. Mm -hmm. And so the first part of it is that you just have to know Allah. If you don't know Allah, you will not be able to quiet your anxieties. But to your question, if you didn't have anxieties to begin with, you didn't have insecurities to begin with, then where exactly is the trust, mm -hmm. right? And this is even with regards to not just day-to-day -day practice uh, or so socio-emotional sort of well-being, even with regards to the laws, of Allah Azza wa Jal. I don't know the wisdom to everything, but it's enough that Allah made it, right? Mm -hmm. I'm trusting that his law is best for my overall like behavioral well-being. Yeah. And that this is, Alhamdulillah, like, I feel like you're giving so much depth to the concept that a lot of us don't, we're, and we're not racist. And I think there's so much um, other noises that weigh heavily. And so you know, the believers constantly struggling with, so what I love that you're saying in that line, I feel like that's the quotable line right there. Worry does not negate the wakul. Um, and who said it does. And I think, you know, in, if we're to ask or kind of add other layers to it, it's like, you know, having, facing difficulty or having, um, you know, sadness or taking action, like none of these negate that you're not um, having the wakul. But then the other aspect that you just touched on, um, or the, like what you shared, I think, Ibn al Qayyim, the four things, right? So you didn't mention the fourth. Did I miss it? No, knowing Allah, believing in decree, engaging the means but not relying on the means okay Those not relying on the means okay yeah. alhamdulillah so i feel like that's a beautiful measure and self-audit that people can use to see where they're at so i think um you know if, if someone's listening to this and you're you're asking yourself where am i on the spectrum or where am i in each of these inshallah and if you feel like one is weaker like this is the opportunity this is the invitation inshallah to um, strengthen it and then i wanted to um also drive some inspiration from our tradition Sheikh, and examples of this that are really real you know be it from the sita um i, I was mentioning too like the story of musa Sam's mother always like speaks to me you know when allah is commanding her and the verses um that show the intensity of those emotions she felt in that moment when she's being told to put her baby um you know musa Sam down the nile and she feels worried Right? Like she feels that immense, like, you know, we would, I, I can't ever imagine what a mother would be going through in that moment. And so Allah subhanahu wa says, like, she, she felt that, but alhamdulillah, she still trusted Allah subhanahu wa And so are there other aspects of like, where we can see the real experience of the Prophet, you know, having that worry or, you know, again, feeling some of those intense emotions, but like the wakul very much being present there in his life. I know there's numerous, but I would love to have you pull one out. Yeah, a, a lot of, uh, a lot of things come to mind. I mean, this is not the Prophet Sallallahu but Abu Bakr in a sense. Um, but the Prophet Sallallahu did also say that I was sort of uh, 
frightened in ways that no one was ever frightened for the sake of Allah Azza wa So he was frightened, alayhi salatu wasalam. Uh, he was hurt, he was pained, he grieved. His wounds were emotional and physical, alayhi salatu wasalam. But what came to mind now, sort of for the summary of, of like engaging the means and worrying and all that other stuff, but quieting your worry, leveraging your knowledge of God, your acquaintance, because knowledge is not the theoretical, it's really the experiential. And that goes to speak to a lot about what is your God image? How do you really perceive Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala? And, you know, it's not like, oh, I've been trained with a fear centric narrative since I was a kid about haram, 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 hellfire. And so I have a bad perception of Allah. No, people became Muslim at 40, 50, 60 years old and had their God image, you know, uh, restored. And so this is fixable. There is a remedy to this. You just got to engage his scripture uh, uh, with intentionality and with also consistency and sincerity and all of that. But the Prophet, وسلم, you know, he, he gets like the, they're turned into fugitives, right? Leaving Mecca. They do everything. They do, like some of the scholars count, 10 to 15 steps that they took to be strategic about escaping the mercenaries. They even traveled south, even though Medina is north, right? They did ever, and they, they set up people to bring them food and people to cover their tracks and so on and so forth. And Isma and Sabi Bakr, Rabbi Allah <laughs> is pregnant, so she's the last person to be suspected. She, like, she's also covering for them. And so him and Abu Bakr are in the cave. The mercenaries actually get to the cave. And so... You know, of course, this is like super high level tawakkul, and, and I, I don't want to be honest with people that, you know, if your life is on the line and you 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 panic, that's totally fine. <laughs> this is fine. May Allah protect us, but it's fine. Uh, you know, like, uh, I'll get back to the story in a second, but this is like this ridiculous uh, before WhatsApp days, like chain email I used to go around that some guy walks in, may Allah forbid, you know, with a, with a gun or a machine gun into a masjid during Jumu'ah. And he says, whoever is willing to die for their Allah, you know, don't move. And so everyone rushes out of the masjid, uh, except for like three, four people. And the imam, of course, mashallah, mashallah, <laughs> the imams, right? And then he tells the, then he turns to the imam and puts his gun down and says, imam, I got rid of all the hypocrites. Uh, you can start your khutbah now. And so that's just, this is just sheer, I have nothing nice to say about like this joke, right? You're supposed to run out of the masjid when someone has a gun. I mean, Allah forbid, right? Uh, but that's not anti tawakkul If your life is on line, you panic, it's normal. Uh, and even if you see Musa, alayhi salam, uh, you know, it, it was not overnight. Even for Musa, alayhi salam, one of the messengers of great resolve, Ulil Azmi al Rusul, that he gets to the water and the army's behind you and the water's in front of you and everyone says, We're finished. And he says, No, my Lord is with me. That was not overnight. When he first came to meet Allah, Azza wa Jal, and the staff turned into a snake, he turned around and ran. It's normal. It's not anti-faith, right? <laughs> and then he, he, you know, he gets with Harun in front of Fir'aun and they contend with Fir'aun and then Fir'aun, you know, uh, sort of like flexes on them, brings out the sorcerers and all this. Allah says, فَأَوْجَسَ فِي نَفْسِهِ خِيفَةً مُوسَى Like he didn't turn around and run. There's like uh, some graduation happening here, but still he felt within himself fear, Musa. And Allah told him, إِنِّي مَعَكُمَ أَسْمَعُوَرَ I am with you. You quiet it with that knowledge of, you know, the being together with Allah in that sense. Yeah. I am with the two of you. I hear and I see. I know what's going on, just, you know. Yeah. And then on the back end of it, when everyone loses hope, they don't lose hope. And so you build up to that. Yeah. And that is why our teachers used to say that tawakkul is, uh, is the secret of Allah in the hearts of his servants. Mm. They used to tell us, don't you dare ever get carried away with the knowledge that you have. Yeah, you memorize these books or give these lectures and can answer these questions on a dime and so on and so forth. He said, but that trader, business trader, like trade transactional, uh, could have so many moments where his back is against the wall and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, you know, uh, pulls him from it, you know, comes through for him in that sense, uh, resolves his issue that he could have far superior tawakkul than you in the school of life, right? These things grow in you over time through experience yeah. that you in the theoretical of the books, here I am, you know, uh, on a podcast being interviewed about tawakkul, I may not necessarily have. The theoretical is very different. Yeah. Anyway, sorry. So they did everything they could to get to the cave. They're there. The mercenaries still find them. So that's the idea. You do your entire effort. You must, but don't rely on it. It could still fail. And then when it failed, you still put your trust in Allah Azza wa Jal, that you know what, whatever Allah wants, he'll make the best of it. Grant me the best whatever you know that is, right? Yeah. That's the whole idea. It still worked. After yeah. their attempts failed, Allah intervened at that moment, kept their hearts on faith, and kept the mercenaries from peeking downward into the, the crack in the wall.
Yeah. There's so much I want to unpack there because I'm like, okay, so if I were to summarize what you've just said, so the wakul is, you know, we take, we do our part. You're trusting Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, so you're doing your part. And you, so the wakul has to then also, inshallah, lead to the da. So whatever happens, you still find peace with it. And maybe that's where people struggle or they're looking for the wisdom or, you know, I'm just kind of like trying to follow that thought process, that specific um, incident in the, in the Sita that you're describing, right? At that moment, like I, they quiet their worries, the Prophet them gives that reassurance to Abu Bakr, then who, and, you know, you're at peace in knowing now I've done my part. And I think maybe that's the point a lot of people, um, you know, don't, don't know how, like when, when have I done my part? At which point can I, can I just sit and find some peace? I always use this example because I'm sure you've heard it, right? Everyone says like, tie your camel, tie your camel. I always remind people like some people are suffocating their camel. Like they're just like, well, you know, and, and I find a lot of the secular language and the emphasis on, you know, you need to do your part is sometimes so much that people have a tough time moving to that place of the dot. Um, and so did, does that? Yeah, parent parents uh, are the biggest uh, <laughs> uh culprits of this right mm. uh they're so emotionally uh invested in the success of their kids however they define it that they may sort of uh i don't want to say ruin but really shortchange themselves and their kids mm. uh and but but like think of istikhara right many people think istikhara is about some dream where allah decides for you that number one of all time you know misnomer about how istikhara operates or works but Istikhara is actually about you making a decision already, which means you're likely emotionally invested. Could be rational, completely rational, completely indifferent, but rare, right? You're you've picked, you got a good hunch, right? Even if the emotional investment is not love in a partner per se or a spouse or fiance, but like confidence. Yeah, yeah, this is the good decision. So you're already you already have a bias, right? But you're saying, oh Allah, if this is not good for me, shut it down. You're saying the wording of istikhara is phenomenal, right? It's just so incredible. It says, you know, if you know this is good for me, you know, facilitate it for me and bless me in it and so on and so forth, the creates for me. And if you know that it's not good for me, in other words, you're saying I, I've done my limit, my level best. And level best, obviously, there has to be like a component, as you said, of reasonability here. Just try to, as your best, to be reasonable. And then just know that there's a blind spot that by definition you can't see. That's what a blind spot is. Uh, and so the humility say, if you know this is not good for me, you say, turn it away from me. And because sometimes something is not an option, you're still chasing. Turn me away from it. Mm -hmm. Right. Show it to me extra clear. So that last part of how much is too much, it is a gift from Allah. It's called kashf in some, you know, lingos. Disclosure. When Allah discloses to you, gives you clarity in a moment of fog. And so that's also part of, you know, trusting Allah. Uh, is is gaining the clarity to know when I should be at peace with this versus no Islam says resilience Islam says work hard because each of these sides you can invoke religious languaging mm -hmm. right and so that's one of the beauties of istikhara like should I be invested as an individual or even in an ummah as an ummah because sometimes like we have these ummah wide discourses that are very uh, troubling where you just say put your trust in Allah Allah will fix the condition of the ummah don't cut corners stop worrying so much but we're not also not fatalists, right? We're not indifferent. We're supposed to actually be trying to help the ummah survive, then thrive, and all that other stuff. And so if the Prophet when he would speak about survival, he's not indifferent when he says, Allahumma ahini ma alimta al hayata khayran li. Right? This is like the apex of submission and trust, right? Uh, and ridha, just being content beforehand he says oh allah grant me life so long as you know that life is good for me mm. even death may not be in my uh, may not be you know the worst case scenario sometimes allah will save people before they go astray by you know cutting their life presumably short right mm. and and put me to death whenever you know that death is better for me mm. and that that dua actually begins let me rewind it the phrase right before it, it says allahumma bi ilmika al ghaib wa qudratika al khalq oh allah by your knowledge of the unseen Nobody I consult, even if I brainstorm and consult myself, no one knows what's going to happen five seconds from now. So why, why should I trust so much anybody, right? 
oh Allah by your knowledge of the unseen and by your power of the creation only you have everything in your grip right mm -hmm. give me life so long as life is good for me put me to death whenever death is better for me so you're not indifferent you want to stay alive you want to stay healthy you want to stay happy you want your kids to stay on stay the right course but at the end of the day so long as Allah knows that's best you have this caveat you know and that is the idea when people make dua also like when you're asking Allah and deferring to Allah be incessant be passionate let the tears fall but don't be demanding right that's the nuance there right you're not entitled and even if you were entitled you thank allah that he filters your dua for you and doesn't give you what he knows isn't good for you that's part of his mercy and why you should love him that he doesn't give in to your uh your incessant pleas that you are so sure are good for you and demands i mean he will he, he doesn't have to give in to our demands but we shouldn't be demanding either right mm -hmm like um, we're uh, uh, anyway long story. it's almost like you know um yeah. jason hamilton really featured this once he's like alhamdulillah that allah doesn't answer our du'as the way that we ask because it is you're asking for something so basic or you're asking for something so limited and, and the way that allah's path and his infinite mercy and blessings answer so it's you know both ways but i feel like um just some of the points that you just shared mashallah that the wakil changes your perception of reality yeah and i and i feel like for people who are constantly searching for you know a measure for themselves of you know how how do I know I'm having trust in Allah how can how can I find um solace and like yes I'm walking that path so I think alhamdulillah the four points you mentioned earlier and then this one um as well that you know the wakul is about shifting the way you're looking maybe at your circumstances and your reality um inshallah your knowledge of who you think um, you know, as you said, your God figure, like how do you perceive Allah subhanahu to be, that can be part of that, uh, laying that foundation of trust. And then, um, I, and you use this word a few times and I love it, uh, and, you know, experiencing our faith. I think so many times we've, we're in the theory of our faith and alhamdulillah that, you know, we have a relationship with the Quran and we read and we're gaining knowledge, but then it's about translating it into the experience of those verses. It's the experience of, you know, the Sita, the son of the Prophet, those Hadith. And I think that's where some of, some of the growing pains are. And we start to panic. We're like, well, it, it seems so easy or it seems so, um, you know, black and white when, you know, we're, we're talking about the Waqar, why is it so hard? Why am I, why am I feeling broken? Why am I having this moment? And so we start to doubt that we're having trust in those moments. Um, so to kind of speak or, or kind of on that um, on that point as well, just like Sh um, Sheikh Muhammad, what would you advise when it comes to what to protect? Like, because so the other part that I, I wanted to also address is the wakul is something that's active and constantly needs to be built, right? It's not stagnant. It's not something you acquire. It's constantly needs to be fed. So Alhamdulillah, you talked about what the four things are to continuously keep feeding the wakul. When it comes to protecting our relationship of trust and love of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, what are some, um, you know, what are some advices you'd give in protecting so your tawakul does not decrease, it's not chipped away at? Because sometimes it's done in such subtle, subtle moments, um, you know, subtle ways that sometimes shaitan or circumstance or situations, the messaging we get. So what are some ways that you would say to be protective of our trust of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala? Yeah, it, tawakkul is really, it's really about yaqeen, no shameless plug for the organization or anything, but <laughs> it really is because the more the conviction uh, blurs and it erodes, the more difficult it becomes to, uh, to pivot based on it, right? To, 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 it's not solid ground and so you don't want to step on it, <laughs> you, you're afraid, it's so brittle. And, and People need to know that knowledge plus devotion, right? Plus sincere devotion equals conviction. That's the formula. Yeah. Uh, and so the, the lack of quantity of our devotion, less recitation of the Quran. This is when it's really good to invoke worship as the rich, in the ritual sense, not just in the wider sense, interior, exterior, right? The ritual and serving humanity and spirit, spiritual states. No, here is when you want to know that like ritual is uh, so profound because it doesn't just express meanings, like I said in the beginning, it also creates meaning. Mm. It creates meaning. And, and that is why Abu Sulaiman al-Darani, um, he, he was asked, Bima tunalu How do you get to the station where you're acquainted with Allah? And I said, it's the first of the four. He was asked, how do you get to the station of getting to know Allah or being acquainted with Allah? He said, by obeying him. 
you know, the more you obey him, the closer sense of nearness, sense of trust, sense of confidence you have with him and in him. Uh, then he was asked the follow up. They asked him, How do I get to that point where I'm obeying him better? And he said, Be he through him. <laughs> so it's like a cycle. You got to get the wheel moving, right? Through him, you ask him to help you, you know, be a better servant. And then through that, you know, you get more acquainted with him. And then naturally, you're going to trust him more and serve him more. And then you get more acquainted with him. And then the virtuous cycle now begins uh, accelerating. And so that's a part of it. And these wheels need maintenance. You, yeah. you know, you got to stay on top of your uh, your stride. And like, so for example, I get more money in this period of my life. That is one of those moments that can eat away at your telecord. It's very interesting how people spend a greater percentage of their money when they have less money. Mm. It's almost like their telecord is more intact when there's uncertainty regarding their finances. <laughs> it's like a little remove the idols. From, from your life. That's the, the supply, the ego, uh, exact, that possessiveness, that assumption of, of ability. It is reported actually that Imam Ahmad, rahimahullah, he used to say that uh, my finest moments are when they say there is no flour, baking flour at home. Uh, that doesn't mean he likes starvation. Like we should not read this in like the, the stoic sense, but he means that those are the moments when I really realized that every single day, every breath of oxygen, every loaf of bread, I'm so dependent on it and it only comes from him, right? Yeah. Uh, those back against the wall moments are, are so healthy. Yeah. You shouldn't seek them out, but you should capitalize on them whenever they come. And so when they're, when they're not around for a while, like moments of prosperity, this eats away at Tawakkul. I mean, the Ummah fell after its golden age for a reason, right? Yeah. We started assuming that we were sort of gods on earth, if you will. We were worshiping our desires. Yeah. Uh, also, and not just prosperity, but also uh, <laughs> parenting. Uh, when, when you just become a parent, parents always talk about like, man, I don't remember being such a wuss, like such a coward the way I was before I had kids. And it's true. Like, yeah. you know, you go hiking and it's just like, uh, it's not even like, oh, the kid might slip. That's already there. Yeah. It's like, oh man, what if I slip? How's the kid going to get home? Mm. And so that's natural, normal, fine. But the more of these vivacious experiences happen, they put dents in our tawakkul, right? Mm. Dents in our notion that we are all moving about within the hand of Allah Azza wa mm. And so you got a devotion is a huge part of it. Of course, you know, uh, daily devotionals in terms of familiarizing, renewing our familiarity with scripture. Uh, and then being vigilant about what may erode our tawakkul such as whatever may put us under the assumption that things are in our hands yeah. and i feel like that one um may seem so straightforward but i feel like you have to sit with it i think the example you just gave of imam ahmed subhanallah it is prime primary that and the whole example of you know when you're in that state of affluence um and how that can deteriorate so maybe being conscious of what are some of the idols in my life right be it desires or other aspects of my life where i subconsciously place my trust right really awakening like our, our soul to that i think is such an important part of the jihad on us that a believer has to constantly be engaged in and i think if i can just add you know one more in terms of vigilance setbacks right like religious setbacks you reneging on your tawbah you know you falling into some sins mm -hmm. usually this comes with chronic sins you just feel so pathetic. And that's one of the dangers of sins, right? That it, it opens the door, gateways to more and more sins because you submit to that condition. But <clears throat> you are supposed to put your trust in Allah and believe that even your sin after, this is important, after you've repented from it is just another calamity that Allah destined you have to go through, another bruise uh, that's supposed to make you stronger, supposed to like rid you of conceit, you know, to help you understand that I'll, more elements of Allah's greatness, like his forgiving nature, his merciful nature. And so even, most importantly, because that's so why this quote was clinging in my head and I just was itching to say it, is that Ibn al-Qayyim rahimahullah says, there's people that do tawakkul wrong and these are the four ways to do it. Then he goes on to say, and there's people that sell themselves short for tawakkul, which is they only trust in Allah regarding their worldly needs. He says, whoever trusts regarding Allah for their worldly needs, Allah will be enough for them. He'll give them what they need and give them contentment when they don't have what they desired. He'll take care of them. 
He said, but whoever trusts Allah for their religious needs, right? Their religious ambitions, their faith. That's why it's You I worship and you I seek strength. I seek strength in you for worshiping you to begin with, right? Like, come to prayer. We say, no might or power except with Allah. So that's where it should be first. He's saying, don't, don't do tawakkul right and then use it for the, for the world only. Use yeah. it for your real life. He said, and whoever does that puts trust in Allah regarding the preservation of their deen, Allah will take care of their dunya and their deen. So, so you're, you're saying through that quote, don't take comfort in your religiosity, like your practices, like don't let that make you feel like, oh, well, I, I'm, I'm protected. There's a certain level um, of trust that, or I don't need the walk in that aspect because I'm praying, I'm a believer, right? The believer recognized that even in their- And the opposite. Life, yeah. And the opposite, that even if I mess up, right? Like if, I, if I'm doing the right thing, uh, no, 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 this is not by me. I don't, only Allah makes Muslims Muslim. Only Allah makes Muslims pray. Ibrahim alayhi salam saying, oh Allah, let me be an establisher of prayer. Even Ibrahim alayhi salam, without you, I'm not even going to offer the prayers, right? Mm -hmm. But at the other end, when you are failing also, put your trust in Allah azza wa jal, that this was for the greater good after you've owned it. After you've owned it, then bucket it like the rest of the calamities, mm -hmm. right? But, and then that, what that comes from actually, if, if it was unclear, it's because you know, there's a really nice hadith that Allah Azza wa allowed Musa alayhi salam and Adam alayhi salam to, to, to get into a discussion. I didn't mean to slam too hard, but it was an argument. Uh, and so Adam alayhi salam is told by Musa alayhi salam, like, how could you do this to us? How could you like uh, set us back, throw us down into this world, get us thrown out of Jannah? Aren't you the one who Allah created with his own two hands and Allah created him his image and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, you know, blew into you from a very special soul that he created and how could you do this to us? And we say that to ourselves a lot. We, we chastise ourselves a lot. Mm -hmm. And so uh, you promised you wouldn't do this anymore and all that other stuff. And so, uh, you know, draw the parallel. I'll let you do the thinking, uh, O listener of the podcast. Uh, and then Adam alayhi salam responds and says, aren't you Musa who Allah spoke to directly? Aren't you Musa who he wrote for you? Uh, that's our raw with his own hand. Aren't you? How could you ask me such a question? How could you blame me for something? that Allah had written on me 50,000 years before the creation of the heavens and the earth. So the Prophet Sallallahu says, so Adam out-argued Musa. Adam won. You say, oh, wait a minute. Is he blaming his sins on God? God's decree, destiny. If God wants to make me a good person. He'll make it. No, that's not what he's doing. That's not what, that's what other people do. No. We know from the Quran that Adam salam, said, oh, our Lord, we've longed ourselves. For he owned it. But after you own it, you find it an opportunity for new and better beginnings, like rock bottom, as they say, is the perfect foundation to go even higher, right? To build on. So Adam alayhi salam there, as Ibn al-Qayyim said, actually raised in rank because of his sin, because had he never sinned, he would never have experienced Allah the forgiver, subhanahu wa ta'ala. So see it as an opportunity, put your trust in Allah that it, it, it doesn't have to determine your future, just the part of the past. Yeah. It's a stumble, but we're going to take that rock you stumbled on and start, start building with it the new you. Yeah. It's a building block, inshallah. I love that. Own your brokenness. Because alhamdulillah, there's strength within that. Alhamdulillah. Jazakallah khair, Shaykh Muhammad. Um, yeah. So before we end our conversation, um, th there's one, uh, there's a two questions left. But one I want to, I'm like, we didn't start off with this, but we're going to end with this, which is, how, like in our tradition, there's many definitions, but how does one define tawakkul? I, I feel like trust in Allah is such a, obviously, injustice to it. So how, how, was, how does one define tawakkul? Okay. It's actually interesting because there's like a disp dispute in the Tezkiyah Tasawwuf tradition about what it means and therefore how does it rank. But just put all that to the side. Uh, maybe a good useful definition to keep in mind. Tawakkul comes from the word wakil. Wakil is like an agent. Like when you give someone a power of attorney to buy or sell something for you, that's a wakil. He's mm -hmm. like your agent. Uh, and, and that is why some people say tawakkul is, is not as high as others would say it is. And it is. Ibn Qayyim has to be right <laughs> on this one. Another time we can talk about it. But their, their grievance with the word is basically, how do you make Allah your agent? How do you give to Allah, authorize him with something that's already his? Mm. Right? And that's why the better definition or the more useful definition for us spiritually, spiritual development wise, uh, how to refine your soul is to, to tawakkul is you carving inside yourself basically this recognition that things should be in Allah's hands they're best in Allah's hands 
his choice for us is better than our choice for ourselves. While still, again, I have to keep saying it, <laughs> on the outside, doing whatever little bit of agency he left with us, we're going to use it. Yeah. While the agency of the heart and the and the outcome of however my agency, you know, sinks or swims, is best in Allah. To recognize that it's best with him. Yeah. We don't want it any other way. So would you also say to recognize and maybe um, it's about acceptance? Like Allah subhanahu wa always our wakil. It's just us finally coming to terms of acceptance of it and, and acting upon that. Yeah, maybe I'm overcomplicating it. Yes, to accept him as your wakil, to defer matters to him in terms of, okay, I'll accept, you know, that sort of thing, to be at peace with Allah as the disposer of our affairs. Yeah. Alhamdulillah. And uh, so one of the final questions I always like to ask my guests is, you know, what is one ayah of, from the Quran right now in this season of your life that you are holding on to that you, you know, find yourself pondering upon or taking strength from a lot in these days? Uh, maybe it's not an ayah, I mean, but uh, Allah's name, Al-Ghaffar, mm -hmm. uh, you know, Allah is Al-Ghafoor, Al-Ghafar. And Ghafoor is the most forgiving. He forgives anything and everything uh, so long as we're alive. And almost anything might be forgiven on the Day of Judgment. So the, the, the width, the vastness of his forgiveness uh, is reflected in his name Al-Ghafoor. Uh, but Al-Ghafar, there's a little bit of a difference. The scholar said Al-Ghafar means the one who's recurrently forgiving. Mm -hmm. uh, that means he'll forgive you for the same thing over and over and over and over again for a lifetime, so long as you're sincere each time. And it really makes you know, a person, if they are permitted some pause with this name, it, it's heart melt melting, really. Mm -hmm. if, if you're like so down on yourself about something wrong you've done and how many times you keep sort of falling back into it, and you're seeking forgiveness from Allah, and each time you're making bigger and bigger promises and bigger and bigger vows and stuff. Uh, and Allah knows you're going to repeat it in five minutes or five days or five weeks or whatever. He's still going to forgive you. Like <laughs> he who is who knows future still, because it's not even just like I've already done this so many times in the past. He also knows that I'm going to do it again in the future. But because he knows that I don't know that, and he knows that I, I was sincerely resolute about not doing it in the future, He'll still forgive me now, mm. irrespective of what's about to happen. And it's just, it's fun a lot. It's, uh, it's such a beautiful relationship that our Lord has for us, alhamdulillah. So trust in Allah Azza wa Jal regarding fixing your past and also, uh, you know, not being haunted by or, you know, overly anxious about your future. He is yeah. al-Ghaffar, subhanahu wa ta'ala. Alhamdulillah. Such an uplifting conversation, Shaykh. And I'm always about, you know, let's plant seeds of hope because that is what the believer holds on to. So Jazakallah Khair for taking the time out and, and having this. And I feel like you've given, uh, inshallah, myself and I'm sure everyone who's listening a lot to ponder and think with. So may, um, you know, I'm, I'm excited to hear some of the thoughts and feedback that people have after this episode and what they take away. So Jazakallah Khair for that. Oh, yeah. Pleasure to be on with you, sister. Alaikum. Alaikum.